just when you thought it was safe to go onto iTunes. This is Next Level Guy. The only website that makes self-development as fun as going to the movies. It's time to take the red pill and escape the Matrix. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Next Level Guy Show podcast with your host, Ian Dawson Mackay. Today's guest is BJ Gadur. BJ is the host of the weekly BJ podcast, a former fat guy who turned cover model and fitness director for the entire men's health brand. He now runs the dailybj.com, not a porn site, where he delivers world class workouts and deep dives onto a wide variety of fitness topics. In this interview, we discuss his story, how you can build fitness into your life by making your own body your own barbell, the key principles and philosophies you need to follow, and what BJ stands for, and how it wasn't always the most helpful nickname he could have been given. But before we get into that, a quick word about our affiliates. I've managed to build up some great relationships with some awesome companies. This allows me to obtain some special discount codes, deals and listener exclusives. So for more information, please go to www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates for further information. I'm particularly loving HelloFresh. They provide all the fresh pre-portioned ingredients you need to cook delicious weekly recipes straight to your door, which is easy. Another is the barbell apparel jeans that feel so comfy but show off your muscle gains in all the right places and the muscle food steaks I've just bought. They're quality meat for an awesome price. They're healthy but super tasty. For these and so much more, please go to www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates. And now to the interview with BJ Gadur. Hope you enjoy. Well, Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. But if we met in a bar, a gym, or whatever, and you had to tell somebody what you did in thirty seconds, you know, what, how would you describe who you are and why you're why you're so well known? Well, I guess I get paid to lift. Uh, one of the biggest things I wanted to do when I was in college at Amherst College, my senior year, uh, two thousand five, two thousand four, around that time. I was a double major in economics and sociology, and uh, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to pursue those outlets. And I asked myself, you know, what what would I want to do every single day? Like, what is my pulse? And everything came back to, like, I had to first get that workout in if that day was going to be a good day. So, uh, you know, ultimately, my entire journey has been focused around helping other people, inspiring people to get fit, but also finding a way to basically fund my passion for exercise so I can keep doing it every day and keep getting better and, and kind of have that built-in accountability. So if we take this back, right back to little baby BJ, you know, was it a turning point that made you want to start getting into shape? I read somewhere that you were a fat kid and I was thinking, you know, you're sitting with a massive six-pack built like a, well, a brick shit house basically. Were you ever out of shape? Did you come out the womb? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was um, mostly like even like so I'm only 35 right now. So I still most of my life percentage wise, more than half of it was, you know, out of shape or kind of, uh, you know, I was a fat kid. So I was always the the heavier kid in school. You know, they called me thunder thighs, <laughs> even when, you know, I didn't have very muscular legs just because I was just a thicker kid and, uh, uh, you know, generally a bigger kid and. You know, I couldn't do a pull-up. I, I couldn't finish the mile sometimes, and we tested that in gym class. So, uh, and I was always involved in sport, and, you know, being bigger, I was able to do do well in a lot of sports like football and, and basketball. But, you know, in terms of, like, you know, fitness or, you know, being attractive to people uh, physically, that was something that just wasn't in the cards for me uh, growing up. So even to this day, like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable – with my shirt off, I hate doing it. I, I mean, I have to do some shirtless stuff just as part of the gig um, that I do, but it, it's my least favorite thing to do, and I just don't feel comfortable. You know, uh, probably will never feel fully comfortable in my skin because of what it was like kind of being made of made fun of as, as a fat kid. And, you know, it's, it's just so funny to me, too, because, you know, I, I joke all the time, like, I wish I had the confidence uh, of Europeans at a beach. Like, there's so many dudes, like – Huge bellies. The, the belly is literally hanging over 
uh, their swimsuit and they're wearing thongs or they're wearing you know, oh, yeah. the European well, the re- European cuts and I'm like I I, tr- I you know I train every day for the most part I eat very well and like I, I just couldn't do that so it's like I, I and it's it's funny so if you grow up in shape or not fat even if you get fatter later in your life. You still have the confidence uh, that you had in your youth, especially with guys. Like women are different. Women, uh, the studies show women judge themselves more harshly, and guys tend to think more highly of themselves. Um, but you know, but if you grew up fat, you always kind of, no matter how good you end up looking or how much better you look, you still will never have the confidence of someone who who was like the, the dude or the girl or whatever in high school. So it's just funny how that works and. Uh, you know, so it's a journey, man. Yeah, I mean, would you think you'd have gone into this kind of industry if you hadn't been a bigger kid while you were younger? Because, I mean, I'm still the fat kid now, but, you know, you seem to be so well suited for that industry. Do you think you're always kind of predetermined to go into this kind of, you know, like helping people get into shape and transform themselves? Well, you know, I, I was always into sports, um, very active. I was a big kind of like Mike Tyson. All the Michaels, by the way. Mike Tyson... Michael Jordan, <laughs> Michael Jackson, uh, you know, gr- uh, growing up kind of in the 80s, 90s. And so uh, I was always active. I, I enjoyed it. And my, my main issues really revolved around food. Food was something that uh, was meant to show love in my family. It became a comfort thing. You know, when I was excited, we celebrated with food. When I didn't feel well, we, we used food to make myself feel better, you know, uh, it really became a, almost, and still to this day, like I, I joke, if there was going to be a, my autobiography would be entitled Between Meals, <laughs> because still to this day, like everything revolves around, you know, like my wife and I will be eating lunch and we'll be talking about what's for dinner. Uh, she also grew up, uh, she had some issues with her weight, you know, early on in her formative years as well. So we, we relate to each other very well um, with that. But so, and they often say like, some of the best coaches, they sucked as players. And if they say, if you can't play, you coach. So p- part of the issue, too, when I was uh, an athlete, I played football in college, and I had four knee surgeries by the time I was 22. So um, my career never really uh, reached its potential, and, and, and it scarred me in a lot of ways. I still haven't even gone back to my, my old college because I just, I, I just have bad feelings associated with the injuries and not reaching the potential I worked so hard to achieve. And not that I was going to make it to the NFL or anything, but you know, it was very important to me at the time. That was my identity as a football player. I've been playing since I was 14. So, uh, you know, being overweight and knowing what that's like growing up and for people to kind of look at you like you're disgusting and not give you the time of day. And then also having all those injuries, uh, because I, I not for no lack of effort is because I, I trained too hard and I, didn't care about my body enough to do things the right way. And I was just trying to get as big and strong as possible. And it broke me down uh, to the point where I was 22 years old. And the doctor told me, like, you've got the knees of an 80-year-old in terms of cartilage damage. And so for me, the passion comes from helping other people deal with those issues or never have to deal with them in the first place. And and they've affected me in a way that, uh, you know, obviously has scarred me, but also opened up a career path for me where I can really help others and, and have that empathy that a lot of people in fitness don't have. I'm not saying you have to be fat or to have blown out your knee to be a good trainer or coach, but it certainly helps to have that perspective when you have been on both sides of the spectrum, you know, totally out of shape, overweight, super fit and shredded and everything in between. There's a a, a relatability that I think uh, I'm kind of, more naturally suited for than someone who was always like the best athlete, always shredded, every always wanted to be around them. You know, that really wasn't my, that wasn't my life story. So. No, I mean, and, that, and that's the way you come across. You come across as somebody who's warm, friendly, humble, who wants to truly help people. You know, you're not one of these guys that you see who's it's just about the brand, just about the look. You seem to be a genuinely awesome guy. So, like, when you were growing up, um, you know, something I always loved was looking at, like, film characters and how I could be like them, you know, and work out like them or act like them. Who did you look up to when you were younger? Was there a particular film? Was there a TV show? You know, was there something like Arnie or something along those lines? 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm biased because I grew up, uh, I, I was born in 82, so I grew up an 80s and 90s kid. And I, I grew up in kind of the revolution of fitness as we knew it. Like fitness wasn't even really a thing. There was bodybuilding. But, you know, in terms of like the, the gym and there actually being a, a person you can hire to, to give you a workout and train you like that, that, that started in the 80s. So, and then there was, you know, Arnold and Stallone and Jean-Claude Van Damme. And I'll even throw Steven Seagal in there because he's, you know, he's one of my favorite uh, guys to uh, you know, what, what, cl- classic, you know, uh, action actor, uh, good and bad, I guess. But, you know, like if you ask me my, my favorite movie, it'd be like Rocky one through seven. I, I love Rockies, like all the Rockies. I, w- I would watch them and, and get so inspired and. You know, you see these physiques on Stallone and in Arnold. And I was also big into wrestling. I loved the WWF, which it was called at the time. And uh, and as a bigger, you know, uh, I was I was a stronger kid, even though, like, I couldn't do a pull up. It was because I was fat, you know, which is hard, just hard to do a pull up. So I, I had a an inclination for, for things that involve, you know, strength and um, expressing it. And, uh, you know, it was really inspired by all that stuff, you know, uh, so, and it's, it's actually really fun now that Creed, the, the new franchise version of Rocky came out and they're making another one. And just to see how that whole thing went full circle and how it's, you know, even today now it's, it's resonating with, with the younger generations. And it's still great for people like me that grew up on the Rockies. And so I, I really grew up in a neat time. And, and with that coming into the 90s, like supplements became a thing, you know, and uh, to see the, the, how much fitness has evolved and uh, I know a lot of times people will reference like the book Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, where it's really everything is about timing. Right. And I was lucky to grow up in a time where fitness was kind of in, in its infancy. And and now it's kind of culminated in its, its evolution of being a couple decades of really a thing, you know, with the fusion of now everything being digital and, you know, social media where uh, all, all this experience and all the trends have, have allowed me to be someone that could have a big impact at this particular time in the world. And uh, maybe not 10 years ago or 20 years ago, if I was born, you know, earlier, or, or if I was born later, maybe I will have, I would have missed this unique time to have a presence. Who knows? But I, I'm grateful that I, that I have the ability to, you know, wake up every day, try to get a little bit better, and then find ways in which I can distill that information and help others do the same. And do you think, is that a problem nowadays that there is all these options, all these fad diets, that information which a coach would normally give to somebody is so readily available now, you know, that people aren't getting the proper training and, you know, have we made it so that everybody can access fitness but not everybody can learn the form, the true, you know, how to do it properly? Well, yeah, I mean, there are so many options, right? Like, there are no barriers to entry anymore, which, which again, the good with the bad. But the good is that if you really know what you're doing and you've got the experience, like within a week, you could have all your key social media accounts set up. Probably within a month, you could have a website up and you could be making money sharing fitness or, or using your platform, and building it up and then, you know, maybe selling ad space or whatever. Like the careers in fitness are kind of almost infinite now, but at the same time, with all that comes with the risk of like someone just being an expert because they look a certain way, but having absolutely no idea what they're doing. Literally just walking into it as like a good looking person who's lean and naturally genetically gifted, but has absolutely no idea how to train someone, especially someone that doesn't have those same gifts. And then with that too, because of all the options and no barrier to entry, uh, you've got still, a, you know, the, the fitness consumer has become a lot more educated you know, I think most people probably realize at this point the shake weight uh, is not really <laughs> a legitimate training tool. Though I will argue, if we go off the theory of progressive overload, if you used a heavier shake weight, you could probably get some gains. But that, that's besides the point. You know, uh, or that you know, waist trainers or vibrating your belly isn't going to result in a six pack. Oh well, I'll I think send, a lot I'll of send people. It back. <laughs> Yeah, well, hey, if, you, if you can send it to me, because I, I still I could still probably find a use for it. But so I, I think we become more educated at the same time, not educated enough to really dis, to distinguish between, you know, this person's offering, that person's offering. And every has a different way of doing things, too. But 
I def I definitely feel for that average Joe, average uh, Jane fitness consumer who you know uh, knows that fitness is important. Maybe doesn't know a whole lot. Maybe was an athlete in the past or did some training with a trainer or was in a boot camp before, or dabbled in CrossFit, but like they got no idea what the fuck to do for them. Like wh what can I? there's so many options. Which one should I do? And they you know people hop from program to program, from trainer to trainer. Um, and I think because people are not approaching it as a lifestyle, it, it's it literally going from program to program or, you know, six week transformation to six week transformation. Uh, they never establish the habits that, that, that are what fitness is built upon, which is consistency. Like the most important thing I try to share with people is that I have made every mistake along the way. I've injured almost every part of my body. i you know, I, I lost the weight and gained more of it back and everything in between, but I have not missed a week of training since I was 14. So we're talking about simplifying things for the, the average consumer. It really doesn't matter what you do as long as you're consistent with it and you enjoy it. Obviously, there are better options. You know, the goal was to, to look your best and get the most amount of muscle and the least amount of body fat and, and perform better and have more energy. There are certainly uh, good programs and bad programs, but a bad program that is followed consistently with no layoffs, that is part of your life, will always outperform the best, most world-class program you do for six, six weeks and then stop. So I, I think it all starts there. It, it's Everybody's got a different exercise personality. Uh, you can't just do something you always enjoy, right? There has to be some work into it. And there has to be a little bit of struggle and discomfort, but... For the most part, um, if you can just find something that you relatively enjoy, you don't hate that much, that keeps you moving, that you can do consistently, that's sustainable, that will always outperform anything else, no matter how great the trainer is or how great the system is. And uh, I think it all starts there. The consistency part of it is really uh, where people that struggle just can't seem to figure out. Because that's the thing, isn't it? You, know, you get these guys who say, like the coach who wants to coach everybody the same way, regardless of your body composition, how you look, your history, what you've done before. You know, it's always three sets of 10, do this, this, this. And you're like, no, it, it can't work for everybody. You know, like if I said to four different people, what's your idea of fitness? You know, one person might say just being able to go up the stairs. One person might say spending, you know, oh, I need to spend hours in the gym to get fit. And, you know, there's, it's such a wide ranging thing. So, how do you work with somebody to find out their goals and start them on this kind of path? Well, so I don't do any personal training anymore because my main, my main passion has been finding ways to create workouts that, frankly, anyone can do. Now, what comes with the programs I make is the scalability. You know, uh, anybody can do that workout, but maybe you're using a, a regressed form of that particular exercise, or you're taking a little more rest, or you're not doing as many total rounds of that circuit. But my, my passion has been finding ways to make fitness accessible. Like I, I went to, I was lucky to get financial aid to go to really good schools growing up, but I, I could never afford a trainer to like give me a, a strength program or teach me how to do things. And so I, I love sharing free information, helping other people kind of figure this out for themselves. Um, and, and my great challenge, you know, like I make when I'm creating a workout, I'm always thinking about all the people I've worked with in the past and all the people that, you know, I might want to work with in the future. You know, I, I try to follow I have a website called the daily BJ dot com and I try to follow all the people that are members on Instagram and see what they're doing and see what they look like. And they'll post, you know, their their movements sometimes. And it just really helps me get a mind's eye for the vast array of individuals I'm trying to serve, because what I know from all my experience and from, you know, the two years, uh, what, the seven years I consulted to men's health and the two years I was their fitness director, the typical guy and gal, because men's health actually has a pretty good female following, believe it or not, like 20% or more of the subscribers are female. Uh, people mostly have about 30 to 45 minutes to exercise. They can ideally get at least two or three workouts a week if they're consistent with it. They prefer to have access to minimal equipment workouts, you know, dumbbells, an adjustable bench, maybe a pull-up bar. Even the moment you go to a pull-up bar, it becomes a program that isn't very accessible. 
to the masses because that you know that's that's an extra thing you have to worry about. Maybe a mini band, maybe a resistance band, possibly a kettlebell. Real high end people might have a TRX, but for the most part, you know, minimal equipment stuff that you can do at home or take to the gym. So uh, my my passion, even though like I love using the latest and greatest tools, and, and I built a home gym for myself that you know has kind of been a dream. Um, I, I can't make workouts for people that have that equipment. So it's all about finding the lowest common denominator of ways in which anyone can access this workout and it can be as hard as it needs to be without being too hard or too overwhelming uh, for that person. And obviously I, I break down programs to, you know, ones that have more of a, a shred or fat loss focus to ones that have more of a gains muscle building focus. But I mean, the real challenge, like some people would say, oh, that, that workout's so simple. It's like, I don't think you get it. Like the, the brilliance is in the simplicity. This is a workout that anybody can do. And, uh, you know, th those workouts are not easy to make. Uh, you can go anywhere and find like a super advanced workout with, you know, complex training and contrast training and drop sets and, you know, stuff that only probably a drug using bodybuilder could even attempt. Um, but, you know, that, that's not going to help the average person who really is just looking for fitness to, to enhance what they're currently doing in some way. You know, they, they want to be leaner. They want to have more energy. They want to be more mobile. They want to be able to move around with their family and their kids. They want to age as, as gracefully as possible. But, you know, they're not trying to be record-breaking power lifters. They're not necessarily wanting to get on stage wearing a Speedo and fake tanner, you know. And, and uh, so it's important to make sure that, like, my goals are not their goals, right? I mean, the stuff I'm interested in doing is probably way beyond what the average person is interested in doing. And um, so the stuff that I tend to share the most is, is stuff that I, I think meets people in the middle in a way where they can, it's accessible, it's affordable, it's convenient, and it gives them about 80% of everything they could probably look for in a fitness program. Um, the other 20% it becomes something you, you start to chase over the course of your lifetime. You know, uh, after about 16 weeks, you know, unless you are, super obese, most people can get to like their ideal body weight. So what happens from there? You want to just maintain that? Well, you can do, you can do that. But the journey then is to like spend the rest of your life building muscle, trying different things, you know, building upon that initial success. And, and that's also what gets tough too, is because the results uh, start to become very, very insignificant, or at least on the scale of what was initially like, if you're fat, and you lose a lot of weight, it's like, wow, great before and after. But then, like, I mean, people have no appreciation for how long it takes to build muscle. It takes a good three to five years to build the amount of muscle that is truly noticeable and uh, that you own, like that becomes part of almost your new DNA, so to speak. Um, so, you know, but if I looked at that from like month to month, it's like you can barely see the changes, you know, uh, so you really got to be into it. it. It's it's really just a crazy space, man. So like, so how would somebody start building that consistency? I mean, you mentioned there that you had been working out since you were fourteen. You know, some people go, they try it a couple of sessions, they come back, they try again a couple of years later. How how did you build that consistency? Like, how did you get over that initial kind of, you know, like the doms, the pain, the the struggles, like, you know, how can somebody listen to this who wants to build a physique like your start on that journey? Well, I think in a lot of ways, man, I became addicted to it. Like when you're a 14 year old kid um, who, who is trying to form an identity and has been underestimated, made fun of, and you found something that can literally change your body at a cellular level. Like the first time I worked out, I was sore for a week. My, my, Football coach taught me how to do the, the main four lifts that were part of my high school football program, which was the clean, the squat, the deadlift, the bench press. And I felt parts of my body I didn't even know were there, like muscles I never knew I had. And it really lit, lit a fire in me that like, wow, I, I can actually change everything about myself uh, on an exterior level that could allow people to see what's actually inside of me. And it, it's really that's why, like, when you know, people say never judge a book by its cover. When I share my before my before picture, like at my worst around seventeen, where like, I mean, everything was 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 going uh, against me. At that it was an awkward phase. I was overweight. It was just brutal. I was at my heaviest. 
And it's like that person genetically is the exact same person that people see today. But the way they treat me today versus the way that I was treated then, you know, th that really truly shows the power of what fitness can do for someone's life. Because there's so many people being underestimated, not given opportunities because of the way they look. And whether that's, you know, fair or not, uh, it, it, you know, perception is reality. And so for me, I was addicted to finding a way to, for people to you know, respect me and give me the time of day. And uh, I, I actually liked the soreness, you know, like it was uh, that you could put in X amount of effort and get X amount back, whether the weights were going up or my biceps were getting bigger, you know, or I, I could, you know, tackle someone even harder. Like that, that's like, that was huge for me. So it became just, it became like part of my DNA. So in terms of being consistent, again, like you have, you know, what's your why? That's important. You know, like at that time, the why for me was I wanted to play college football, you know, and then from there it was, I want to uh, inspire other people to see the benefits I've experienced from fitness because had I not gotten fit and lost that weight and, and being able to play well enough, uh, you know, football, I would not have been able to go to Amherst college. And then I met my wife at Amherst college. Like, so if I maybe stayed fat and didn't play football as well as I did, I would never have met my wife. And so we're talking about these small things that like end up making a huge difference in the tra trajectory of your life. So I've always had a why. And then when you're, it's, when you're in it as a career, like no one's going to listen to what I have to say if I'm fat. You know, um, or I don't know how to show the movements properly or I don't, you know, have a look that that might inspire people to get better. So there's always been kind of a built in accountability for me. You know, I, I have a home gym with everything right, right as we're recording this, man. Like I, I am five yards away from starting my workout. You know, like I, I set this up in a way where there are no excuses. And uh, so, you know. Not everybody has that ability, you know, uh, because fitness isn't their career and they have kids and they have a very busy job. So their why is probably different than mine. You know, uh, maybe it's to, to keep the spark between their significant other or, you know, it, it's, it's to just, you know, feel good about themselves when they're, when they're doing a presentation at work or they're, you know, um, with other people. They have the confidence to speak well and, uh, you know, so. The, the why is tough, man. Like it's hard for people. It's hard for me to help someone find the why. I, I try to share information as freely as possible for people that have found the why and are looking for the best way to, you know, answer that question and, and get get better. Uh, but trying to give like when people ask me, like, I need your help getting motivated. It's like I, I can't help you. You know, like that that is something that that is the ultimate disconnect with fitness. Like everybody wants to be rich and they want to be fit, but very few people want to do the work that it takes to do both things. Right. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> getting motivated to do that stuff, like that, that's something that I think a lot of people say they can help you with, but that, that is, that is something completely inside of your, your mind and your heart and your soul. And you've got to figure that out first. Cause that's the thing, isn't it? It's like how many people, can really say they wanted something when they just start and stop you know i think it kind of shows them really like the real why that if you go and start the gym and you're just not enjoying it then you know you should just stop and do something else i mean so say somebody listening has a why you know maybe it's they've been bullied like i mean i was bullied in primary school and it motivated me to get bigger um maybe somebody's needing to be able to lift the grandkids or you know the thousands of reasons how do they start this? Well, what's the best way to get the bang for their back? Should they look to lose some weight, to lean out? Should we be looking at um, just strength, just you know, just building up a bit more fitness in your daily life? Is there a kind of general philosophy that you follow? Yeah, I mean, it's all about low-hanging fruit, right? The most important things for someone who's looking to start is to really just establish a sustainable baseline level of activity. We, most of us, you know, like we're, we're sitting down right now recording this. Even if you're standing, you're not doing a lot of movement. Uh, we're spending most of our days at a desk or we're, we're traveling a lot and, and commuting and we're, we're seated. We're off our feet. We're not doing a lot of stuff. All the baseline activity that used to be built in the, into our, our old jobs, manual labor and, 
outdoor activities and stuff like that is gone. So for me, it always starts with trying to build up to about 30 to 60 minutes a day of just non-exercise related activity. You know, for me, it's walking the dogs. I try to get at least two to four dog walking sessions in throughout the day. Uh, I, I try to, instead of doing like one longer walk, uh, the research actually shows it to be better to do them, uh, you know, shorter, more frequent walks is again, what'll happen, the more you spend in any certain position, like sitting, uh, the more your body starts to adapt and form into those shapes, which is bad. You know, it's a flex, rounded position, the hips tighten up, the spine, uh, you know, rounds out, uh, your posture goes to hell. Um, so for me, that is something that happens no matter what, no matter what, that's the no matter what movement uh, on days when I don't, when I don't do any sort of intense training, there's always at least some of that. And then also some basic mobility work. So I call it hashtag Netflix and stretch stuff you can do while watching TV, you know, at night or during commercials that just makes you feel better. Cause really the, the problem, most people, they, they, they want to move, they want to do it. Like there's a reason why, you know, those training montages and Rocky are so popular. Like people want to be like Rocky, you know, doing the one arm push ups and, and the, the log lunges and all that stuff. They, they want it, but oftentimes they don't know where to start or that they have pain or they're overweight. Um, and the low hanging fruit is the best place to start because, you know, people make fun of walking. And I used to be that guy too, like walking can't do anything for you. You got to do intervals and you got to do heavy resistance training, but it's like, at the end of the day, like, what are we most likely hoping to be able to do until the day we die? Walk. You know, squatting may not be <laughs> in the picture for all of us in our 80s and 90s, uh, though obviously we have to get in out of a chair and that type of thing, so it's a foundational movement, but uh, being able to walk is critical for the human species. So yes, it does kind of start with that because you start walking, you start feeling better, you will definitely, your body will respond to anything you haven't done before. So uh, it's that like magic time when you're a beginner that no matter what you do, you're going to see some improvement. And then it's stuff you can build upon. And then you start doing mobility work. You start stretching your hip flexors and uh, opening up your chest and like, wow, like it doesn't hurt as much to, to, to move around. So I'm, I want to move more, you know, and then you start looking at your diet and you start getting, you know, for, from a dietary standpoint, it really my plan is, is as simple as it can be. Don't even worry about necessarily cutting things out. Just make sure at your meals, mostly protein and produce is on your plate. Just by doing that, people immediately see benefits in terms of fat loss, energy improvement, muscle gain, even without resistance training. If you increase your protein intake, you can build muscle. They've shown that with bedridden patients. So there's all this low-hanging fruit, right, that we can start incorporating and then – you get to the point where, you know, I'm walking at least an hour every day throughout the day. Some sort of stretching, mobility work, you know, maybe five to 20 minutes a day. And uh, I'm eating well about 80% of the time. I've got this foundation I can now build upon for the rest of my life. I mean, and that's why I love your stuff is that there's so much there that you don't need to have a gym. You don't need to have access to state-of-the-art equipment. You know, you've got the bodyweight stuff. You've got the next, you know, the stretching while watching Netflix. And there's really is something for everybody, no matter what you're into. You know, but can you define, like, you know, how can we know somebody's fit? Is there such a thing as baseline activities that everybody should do, or is that just too hard to do because of so many different goals and challenges that people want well number one thing is the most important thing i think for people is work capacity you know when i was out of shape it's so funny like i, I would i would always hit my lifting sessions but i would take the elevator instead of the staircase i'd park right as close to a building as i could and the thought of like like a 10 minute walk that my, my dad my dad always used to try to get me out of the house away from the video games you know he came from he's an immigrant from tunisia who uh, at 10 years old became the breadwinner for his family when his father passed away, found a way to get to this country, became a successful engineer, uh, and has allowed me to pursue this American dream. Like I, I literally, uh, I, I work from home, I do what I love, it's, it's all built on, on his sacrifice. And for him, one of the most enjoyable things was just going for a family walk. And I, I hated walking so much because I, you know, 
it, it, walking to me was exerting. It was, it was a, like if a walk is not something you enjoy because you're that out of shape, that, that's a big red flag, right? Like for now, walking is one of my favorite things to do. Like I, I think about my whole day. I plan my whole day. I, I get creative on my walks, listening to podcasts or music, you know, with my dogs. And it, it's, it's a special thing I do with my dogs and my wife, you know, post meal walks we do, digestion walks, we call them. And uh, it just becomes part of your day. You can talk and, but that was never like activity has become part of my culture. My culture before was TV and video games. So, um, you know, like if you get winded going up the stairs, like that's a problem. So th there's certain things like activity isn't enjoyable when you're overweight and you're in pain. So everything that you need to be focused on is finding ways to, to get to the point where just basic activity it, it is leisure. It's not work, right? It might start like walking might start as work, but the goal is to get to the point where walking is, is a, a relaxation thing. You know, you don't think twice about going to do something because something hurts or, you know, you're going to get too tired to do it. You know, there's no quality of life with that. So uh, to me, really, like it's about just first improving quality of life. And you do that by helping helping people get out of pain uh, with lower intensity stuff like the, the problem that happens with fitness is the zero to 100 mentality. It is totally black or white. Like people will have been at this point, like by the time the New Year hits, you know, holidays, all, the, all that shit, they haven't probably worked out in a couple months. They've gained five to 10 pounds from bad eating habits and travel and all that other stuff. And now they want to try to do a workout that someone like, you know, I do, um, you know, plyo push-ups and jump squats and, you know, and <laughs> There's just no way it's sustainable. You're going to burn out. You're going to get hurt. And then you're always going to have a negative association with fitness. It's going to be punishment versus what it really is meant to be, which is improve your quality of life. So, you know, that's a tough thing to get. Like what people are looking for from a good workout, unfortunately, is you got to be sweaty, sore, and tired. If they're not sore the next day, they don't think you're a good trainer. They don't think the workout was hard enough. It's almost like they want they have this association with you have to punish me. I need to punish myself for the glutton that I was over the holidays versus, you know what? I'm never going to allow myself to do that again. I'm never going to ever like the research is pretty clear on this. Like if you just did one, if that person just did a single strength workout a week for the last six weeks of the year, they will at least maintain their strength. That's like a single a 10 to 20 minute workout once a week will at least maintain your strength. You know, uh, just just planning out a couple of what, what I call these fuck it meals, like people call them cheat meals. I say fuck it because that's like literally what I say in my head when I have them. You know, um, if you just plan them out, like where okay, I'll give myself one or two a week, but then I'm just going to be really good the other times versus like you, you have a, a shitty meal on Monday and the whole week goes to hell. You never have to be in the situation where you're starting over again. So, you know, that is like that's my life's work, man. It's like I, I've, I've got all these people that – uh Look to me at the dailybj.com, my membership site, where you know I'm sharing workouts and meal plans and podcasts and all this stuff, just trying to get them into this same mindset where you never you never flip the switch off. The, the switch might be dimmed. Like there's right now we're doing what's called 12 days of fitness, which means in, instead of people being because I knew what was going to happen, we've done a lot of like more intensive programs throughout the year when they you know, but now it's busy, it's end of year, people are traveling, you know, they need they need some time away from work and and working out frankly like you know there's times where you do want to dim the switch a bit so I, I simplified it for them look let's not go crazy with our workouts this month but i want you to get these 12 days of fitness done 12 total workouts as, as little as 12 minutes as long as an hour based on how you're feeling that day or how much time you have and, and you will maintain all of the results you've gotten from this year and then feel really ready to get after it in the new year without having to to restart anything in fact that rest might actually help them hit it even harder in January. Um, so instead of worrying about flipping the switch on and off, know how to you know dim the switch a little bit, dim the lights, and then if, when you want the light to go all the way up, uh, you, you know it, you only have to flip it from a you flip it from a higher position, right? So that mindset is really tough to get through people's heads, uh, but once you get there, man, it's amazing. Like it's amazing, so hard to build muscle. And get results. It's a lot easier to maintain it. And if people never get in a situation where they lose the gains they've made, you know, 
that's where the consistency uh, is truly the difference maker. Yeah, I mean, I really, really like that mindset because, yeah, because I used I'm, to go down and then have to come way back up. But now I kind of just generally keep fit. Like, I, we, we share a lot of sort of parallels because I was lifting really heavy. I, I had a nice deadlift, a good squat and that. And then I've started, like, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I was getting out of breath in the warm-up because I wasn't, you know, I was getting high blood pressure when I was getting a test in the hospital because I wasn't doing any cardio. I was going up like an elevator rather than doing the stairs. And I think I kind of forgot that side of things. So, you know, how can we, like, is there somebody listening to this? You know, should they be able to walk four flights of stairs? Or, you know, how how can you tell somebody's got a problem? If you get sore from walking for 30 minutes, that's a problem. Uh, If you have regular joint pain, that's a problem. If you're carrying more than 20 pounds of excess weight, particularly in the middle of your body, midsection area, you're at great risk for health issues, especially as you get older. So, you know, those are some big red flags. And in terms of, you know, the things that we, boiling fitness down to the simplest of movements, you know, uh, we need to be able to do some form of squatting. We need to do some form of pushing, push-ups, dips, presses, some sort of pulling, pull-ups, rows, um, some sort of movement uh, that's primarily through the hips, like a, a hip hinge or a hip thrust, you know, and then you look at things like some, you know, other things like core work and stuff like that. But, you know, really it's push, pull, hinge, squat, and then carry could be, uh, you know, a guy like Dan John, a famous fitness expert, kind of broke fitness down into those five things. It's a great way to look at it. Like you can build a circuit off of that. Like it can be fitness can be as simple for you as, uh, one minute you do one move, the next minute you do another, and there's five minutes there, five movements. That's a five-minute circuit. And then you could do that up to six times for a 30-minute workout. Even, you know, uh, two or three times, 10 to 15 minutes is plenty for most people. But you hit all the key movements of your body. And all this stuff, by the way, you could do at home. I could do the – I could squat for a minute. I could do push-ups for a minute or a plank hold for a minute if, if the push-ups are too hard. I could do – you know, a side plank or a lunge, a step up. I mean, these simple, basic, it all starts with your body weight, by the way. I wrote a book called Your Body is Your Barbell because, uh, and again, it talks about like the foundation, right? Like for me, the mistake that was made is my foundation was barbell work. And I I, I was bench pressing and I couldn't do a fucking push-up. Like how ridiculous is that? Like one of my buddies, Jeremy Scott, a fellow fitness expert, has a rule in his gym. Like if you can't bench press 135, if you can't do, uh, what does he say? If you can't do 10 push-ups, you can't bench press. I, th- I believe that's the rule. But So it, it all starts with your body. And part of the reason I had all these injuries are that when you, when you focus first on loaded movements without a body weight foundation, you tend to not develop full range of motion and stability through your body. And uh, you may start making shortcuts to just get better at that specific lift, like the squat – bench and deadlift are three great movements, right? They work most of your, your entire body. If you got those lifts up over time, you're going to get stronger. And as long as your diet was, was pretty good, you'd probably get leaner too. You, you know, you get more overall performance, all that stuff. But you're so locked into those movement, movement patterns that you're open to open yourself up to a lot of injury. And uh, again, when you're chasing load, injury almost always follows. There's a reason why, I mean, power lifters never really choose to end their careers. They, 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 it's chosen for them because they have to get their hips, knees, and shoulders replaced. And they're open, you know, and, they're open and honest about that. They love, they love the sport. They know that it's going to cost them quality of life uh, down the road. But it, that's why it's crazy for me when I see when general fitness people like are worrying about Olympic lifting or power lifting or let's see, what, like just do goblet squats. Just hold the dumbbell in front of your chest sit to a box and do 10 to 20 reps. You'll have little to no impact on your joints. Uh, it's a type of squat anybody can do. You could do it at home when you travel. You know, so for me, it always starts with movements that you can do forever. You know, a barbell squat requires a barbell and a power rack. You know, that, that is automatically something that becomes out of reach for like 80% of the people in the world. Like you and me, it's like, oh, it just you can go to a gym or, just get a, a rack in your house. Like people aren't thinking about that. So 
But everybody has a couch that they can sit down onto and stand back up. And that's the best way to learn how to squat. So that's how I like to approach it as you start with the foundation of, of, of being able to use your body with maybe a pair of dumbbells. And then what happens, you know, is you get some success with that. Oh, you add a new piece. Oh, I'm going to get a pull-up bar. I'm going to get, you know, a kettlebell now, or I'm going to get some bands. So uh, when I travel, I can put them in my bag and do some quick band workouts. So once you see a little success and becomes more of a priority, you start digging deeper, your, the value of, of fitness goes way up. So now you're willing to spend more time, more money, uh, you know, more resources. It becomes a bigger part of your life. And most people never get to that point because they're given stuff that either they can't do because it's way beyond where they currently are from a fitness level standpoint or access standpoint or price standpoint. And, uh, you know, again, another big disconnect there is, is, is starting with things that you see other people do and you think you have to do them. Like you don't have to just because Arnold did back squats doesn't mean you do, you know, um, and, and I think that's a big thing to overcome. But. So I, I love all the moves that I'm all about are, are low impact, high return stuff that technically you should be able to do for the rest of your life uh, with very few excuses around them so that, you know, you, you can be consistent with it where, where some people will, will like it'll be uh, they'll be traveling for two weeks and they'll have no gym access. So they'll say, OK, I'm just going to take I'll just take the time off because I have no squat rack and then I'll just come back and start over again. It's like, no. You, you could have done lunges, step-ups, Bulgarian split squats, you know, uh, squat jumps. You could have done hill sprints. Like, there are so many things you could have done that actually could have improved your fitness over those two weeks. But because you're so locked into this particular movement that requires all this equipment, you're just going to stop? So that mindset is tough to break. Because uh, you, uh, see, you see that with people who are coming, you know, like the, the New Year resolutioners. They'll come in, they'll see, they'll, they'll want to get fit, and they'll see, oh, look at all those guys squatting, so I've got to do that. But they don't know how to squat. They copy guys to think, oh, I've got to be doing that kind of weight, oh, I've got to do that because they're doing that. How can people who are, you know, like, just follow this kind of general advice, you know, the, you know, keep a simple, stupid kind of approach? How can we do stop comparing ourselves to the other guys? Stop caring about what other people are doing, especially that you know the self-conscious people who are maybe a bit extra weight, who are out of breath every five minutes. How can we get out of our heads and focus on our own shit and our own transformation? Well, you know, again, I'm I'm very introverted. I'm some would call me antisocial. I'm definitely an antisocial exerciser. So. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of training at home for a lot of reasons. I've always I've always hated training in a public space because uh, my personality is is competitive. So I would always do stupid shit just to keep up with my friends and my buddies. And you know I put way too much weight in the bar because I wanted to beat the next guy, uh, the guy that was next to me. And so the big shift happened for me when uh, I said I was a fan of Michael Jackson. The man in the mirror mentality, one of his best songs ever. Okay. And that, you know, just putting your blinders on, nothing else matters except you. Nothing. You know, I have, uh, I was lucky to be on the cover of Men's Health magazine uh, in January of this year. And I have that image up on the board, not because, I, you know, it was a big goal. I'm, I'm proud of it. Yes. Some would say, oh, he's a douchebag. He has a picture of himself on the wall. Fine. Okay, if you think I'm a douchebag. But for me, it's just a reminder of why I'm doing this. I'm doing that to kick that person's ass, to beat him. I'm beating BJ yesterday. Whoever he was yesterday, I'm trying to get a little bit better today. And every single day, I snowball that little bit better approach. And it's so amazing what happens. Like as I go on from 25 to 30 to 35, I've managed to improve with age because I get smarter with my training and, and I've kept the focus exactly where it needs to be is what's best for BJ. You know, for Ian, it's, it's what's best for Ian. Even if uh, I'm doing something different than you, um, it doesn't matter because, you know, it's so, it's so funny. I almost feel like I'm cheating at this point in my life because I found movements that give me better results without as much pain or recovery time. And uh, while I see other people like still doing like making making the workouts way harder on themselves than they have to be causing pain, 
you know, getting, getting to the point where the hardest thing they're doing in a given day is their workout. Like that, that says something too, where like if, if you're getting anxiety around exercise every single day, I mean, that's the last fucking thing you want from a fitness program. You know, unless you're, unless you are a professional exerciser, there should be no anxiety from your, from your workout. It should be, you no, know, you might not always want to do it. You might have lower days of motivation. Absolutely. You're going to have shitty workouts, but you know, it shouldn't be the biggest cause of stress in your life. I mean, it is a stress so we've got to find the right amount of stress to give you the minimum effective dose, you know? And, and uh, so that's always what I've been chasing is how, how can I share with people the smallest amount they have to do to get the result they're looking for so they be, can be consistent with it and be motivated to keep coming back and improving upon that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a lifelong challenge. I mean, I, I, I'm doing the best I can, uh, finding new ways to keep people in the game. And, but, you know, I, I know that was kind of a, a big, you know, tangent on the whole thing here, but, uh, I almost even, I lost my train of thought because I went so far away from probably what you originally asked. No, I mean, <laughs> You do very detailed, you know, inspiring and encouraging videos. So you've mentioned that, you know, you're quite introverted and we're probably the same kind of mindset. But how do you keep doing like, you know, how keep doing the videos and being so comfortable in the camera? Is it because the the passion and the intensity that you have for fitness? You know, how can somebody in a similar position who's feeling a bit introverted but would like to make, say, a YouTube video of this or... Put, or put themselves out there how can they become more confident by yeah, in front of an audience well you know that's that's now i remember where i was going before i lost my train of thought uh just the whole man in the mirror thing right like when the reason i exercise i don't like training with anybody because it's like what's the benefit of me doing this like I, I like a lot of people in fitness like whenever i visit their area they're like let's get a workout together i'm like that's the last fucking thing i want to do like maybe let's go hang out for coffee or you know, get a bite to eat together. But like, what is the purpose of me doing this single workout with you today? We're not going to train together on a regular basis. Uh, I, I've got different needs than you do. And, and I'm not trying to compete. I, I don't want to I, I, like, honestly, like all the injuries I had were revolved around competition. It was like trying to reach this amount of weight in six weeks. These, these predetermined deadlines that, uh, you know, like, that I let used to control my life. Like people in comp competitive environments are the ones with the most injuries because they are constantly sacrificing uh, the long term for the short term. And when I got out of that mindset of competing with other people or these predetermined deadlines, like I go on timelines now. Like if I want to accomplish something, you know, I, I, I have an idea of what I want to do and I pursue it with, uh, you know, to the best of my ability, the the sets, reps, whatever programming to help me get there. But if I don't get there on March 13th, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I'm certainly not going to let myself get hurt to hit March 13th because what's the point of hitting a goal when you're injured? So it all comes back to that man in the mirror approach. And when you train at home, beyond the fact that like we know the studies show that if you have to go more than five minutes from where you live or work to exercise, the chances of you doing that exercise – has been dramatically shortened. Like it has to be, like you said, the, the stupid, simple approach. You have to put yourself in a situation where it's almost impossible to miss and, and that you're never going to get sidetracked with what's important to you. Because when you start going to the gym and you see what that dude's doing, this guy's got the best biceps I've ever seen. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, you know, um, and you start looking at him and comparing yourself to him. That, that's the thing. Like I can go on Instagram today, man. I've been uh, I, I, you know, I think I'm pretty fit and uh, I've been consistent for a long time, but I can go on Instagram right now after we finish recording this and find within a minute, 20 people better looking than me, more fit than me, bigger, stronger, whatever, faster. And I can get super depressed about it. Or I can look at the fat guy that I used to be and reflect upon all the changes I've made up until this point, the impact I've had around the world, sharing fitness with people. And I can be proud of that. So I think whether it's fitness, career, relationships, always looking at the prettier guy or gal or the richer, you know, dude or the person with more resources. And then I still have to remind myself of this 
every once in a while because I'll, I'll go on Instagram like how did that person get that many likes and what I just shared is way more valuable and, and, and people barely saw it and it's like again reminding me of what the mission is and the mission is it's it's not necessarily to reach as many people as possible I love to do that but it's to profoundly impact as many people as possible so and in the same regard how do you build the confidence in your workouts you start ground zero. You know what I mean? Like I said, the walking, the mobility, cleaning up the diet, you know, getting rid of liquid calories and, you know, still having flexibility, but just putting, uh, you know, a, a time frame or a cap on that level of flexibility. Uh, these small things we can do, starting with a 10 minute workout at home using just your body weight. And then it's amazing what happens. Like the problem, man, people want to make a change. They want to start fresh for the new year. They're overweight. They don't even have, they don't even know what clothes to wear to the gym. Like that, that's like a whole, like, that's the thing. Like, what do I wear to the gym? Like I, I, do I wear this big shirt to hide myself? You know, uh, so there's anxiety just around showing up, just getting to the gym for some people becomes more than, more than the workout. It becomes a bigger challenge than just the workout. So put yourself in a position where you can focus on you, not compare yourself to other people. And, uh, and again, I, I'm not trying to like shut down gyms around the world or get people to become hermits, but I'm, I'm a huge fan. I, I like all the people I know. I'm just telling you right now, all the people that I know that are, are fit and have been fit for a long time have created a lifestyle that makes it hard not to be fit. You know, they only have good stuff in the house. They have the ability to train at home if they absolutely need to or they want to. Um, they're just set up so that all the excuses that can happen for us um, have been minimized in some way. And so, uh, man, I, I, it's it's a daily challenge. Like, how do you not like? You do this podcast, right? It's like you see other people that have maybe a bigger podcast following. And it's like you, you could get really upset about the fact that they have more more of a reach. Or, you know, it's like you and I get to chat today about stuff that we love. And there are going to be people listening to this that are going to be impacted, hopefully, in a positive way. And, you know, it, it, my mindset is pretty big. When you, start, when you were the fitness director for Men's Health, how did you make sure that we, you're moving the, the that brand towards the transformation for people? You know, that the advice they were given was great. Did you look at, like, fitness around the world? Did you see a kind of a culture shift? Or, you know, how did you make sure that the advice you were given was applicable to all people from all kind of religions, setups, goals, ambitions, etc.? Well, my, my background when I used to train people in corporate settings, boot camp settings, personal training, I had such a diverse amount of, of clientele, all walks of life, all fitness levels. So I was forced very early on to learn how to scale exercises and workouts so that, again, like you'd, be, you'd come into one of my classes and there'd be someone who is morbidly obese and someone who has a six pack. We're all doing the same workout. And that person is working just as hard, you know, the, the obese in the six pack, relatively working just as hard, but just doing either a different movement or something that's, you know, based entirely on where they're at. And, and that to me was like, that, that really is where fitness becomes like a, just an amazing unifier. And like you can have, you can share that experience with someone at the completely opposite side of the spectrum if the workout is designed properly. Um, so, I came in with that background. I, I was a fan of the magazine since I was a teenager. I always wanted to be on the cover. You know, that was a 17-year goal that I achieved. Uh, some could say, like, Jesus, it took you that long. And I'm like, yeah, it did um, to, to achieve that goal. And But, the you know, the biggest thing, you know, I have access to analytics, too. I, I could literally see, you know, the moment that we, we used a kettlebell instead of a dumbbell, you know, 50% less people would be interested in doing that workout. You know, so you start learning all that. And again, it's always coming down to uh, sharing something that is as accessible as possible. Even, I mean, really the biggest thing that, that changed for me is I stopped worrying about what other trainers thought about my workouts. And I start started really focusing on how is this going to instantly help someone get better? And maybe that got me more, you know, insults or whatever from other trainers or the work. This is nothing new here or this is basic bullshit. But more people around the world were, were actually being able now to access the programs because it met them where they were at. 
It might be simple for someone like you and I who are really fit and have been doing this for a long time. Mm. But what I found at Men's Health, man, is like people are still learning like about the push-up. They're not past the push-up yet. So why are we doing, you know, the, the why are we trying to push like the six set chest shock German volume routine when they're really like just trying to figure out how to do the push-up? So that, that was a big shift. And so, you know, I think early on, whether you're in fitness, whatever career you're in, it's very easy to get focused on trying to like prove yourself to your peers more than actually delivering to the customer or the user. And that's a huge mistake. And I, I, obviously the, the younger you are, the, you want like the less, you know, too, the more you want to like show fancy movements or like, I made a joke about this recently, like early on in my career, I, it was all about trying to create quote unquote, create, cause you can't really create a new exercise. It's all been done at this point, but create a new exercise that would get people who didn't like to exercise to keep coming back. And now it kind of the, I don't give a shit phase of my career. I'm just trying to get as many people as possible who like to exercise to master the basics. And, and that's a big shift. And it might come at the expense of me not getting as many likes or shares on Instagram or having, you know, the mass appeal of some of the truly household names we know in this space. But at least I know the people that I am impacting, I'm, I'm doing it in a very deep way and I'm giving them a foundation they can build upon. So, you know, uh, that's a big mindset shift. And, you know, uh, the, the time at Men's Health definitely helped me figure out, and, and I still have to remind myself some time, like, that maybe this, because you never know, like, sometimes I'll post something that I think that will do terrible, and it does well. And I'm just reminded again how important it is to try to stay in touch and remember that there are a lot of other people on the other side, and they're not, they're not me, but I used to be them and try to get in their mind and think about what they'll, how they'll perceive what I'm sharing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating, man. Like, it, it, you know, you never know like what, what people are going to like. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get shocked sometimes with what they don't like. You, sometimes I think something will kill and it tanks. But again, that, that, that whole consistency comes down to, you know, the consistency in fitness is my consistency with everything else. Like, because I'm going to be sharing more consistently than anybody else, or at least as much as anybody else, you know, that that's how I can stay relevant and learn. And uh, where most people just, you know, you want to be uh, someone who reaches a lot of people, you got to share stuff every single day. And most people don't know how to do that or, or aren't willing to make that sacrifice. It's a lot of work. I mean, I, I don't know how many podcasts uh, you do a week, but even a single weekly episode of a podcast, people will start a podcast and they're like, oh, it's easy. I'll just do one a week. And it's like, okay. Let's see how long that lasts. Like, so I, I, I have such respect for you just for being able to have a regular podcast because I, I do one as well. And uh, people tend to overlook how hard it is to do a good one and do one on a consistent basis. And so uh, consistency, man, it, 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 it transcends everything. I mean, that's why I think you do so well is because you're not just scratching the surface. You know, you're not just scratch niche you're actually finding out what's wrong you know you're get you're finding the, the the emotional pain and you're you're helping drive them out through it so where does your creativity come from i mean i've noticed you've made some amazing products especially for men's health you've done some viral videos every time i click on to one of your social media you have a new video out a uh, follow along exercise or you're you know i've got another another product on the go you know, how do you keep this going? Because you're the brand, you know, you're the face. When it's you as the brand, how do you keep being creative and bringing people back and encouraging them? You know, can you go into a little bit about your mindset for like the business side of it? How did you find the the change from coach to you know running your own your own gig? Well, you know what, a lot of that is in my DNA. Like I. I have been, and these are other people's words about me that I'm a lone wolf and that, you know, uh, always beats to his own drum. This is just stuff that people have said about me over the years. And so I've always been very independent. I, I, I hate getting help from other people, uh, at, at, at a negative expense sometimes too, where like I could probably use some advice. I mean, I, I have, you know, here's the thing. Like, I don't like unsolicited advice. The quickest way to like, 
get, get on my bad side is to give me, you know, unsolicited feedback or advice. Because, again, like at this point in my life, I know all the people uh, and, I, and I, I know of the people that I would probably want to ask advice for on a particular topic. So if I if I need the advice, I will ask it. Uh, but I, I hate it's just like, again, it's we've all got our own character flaws. For me, I, I don't take feedback well unless I ask for it. And even if I ask for it sometimes, like my wife, my wife makes jokes about how I ask her something, she gives me the feedback, and then I end up doing the exact opposite of what she said. So uh, I think that happens a lot with family and friends. But, you know, so uh, that that is something that is definitely one side of it, too. Also, like character flaws, like. I am very easily fatigued by other people. I knew the men's health gig was not going to last more than a couple of years because I, I just can't go into to an office every single day and see the same people and not get sick of them. You know, I, and I, and, and it's not to say any bad thing about those people. It's just, I, it takes a lot of energy. Like I can be social for a couple hours. And then after that, I've got to spend the rest of the day, like laying on a couch decompressing. So being a loner, being very independent, being uh, easily fatigued by other people, you, you're, you're forced to spend a lot of time on your own. I was also an only child up until about 12. I went to a very uh, uh, wealthy kind of private school on financial aid, but I was the only like kid there who wasn't like super wealthy, so I wasn't in those social circles. So I never got invited to things like birthday parties, or so I, 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 had to, I played by myself a lot and. You know, you start having a lot of conversations with yourself and this is, this is like, this is becoming like almost like the beautiful mind in a way. But, uh, but it's important that the background is important because, you know, I, I've chosen a path that not a lot of people have, will, will choose, which is like everything is on you. Like men's health was the, the only real job I ever had, like where I actually went to work somewhere. I, I have always uh, made a living on my own, working from home, have my own business or businesses. And so it, it's very particular to my personality. It's not for everyone, you know, and so, but, but it, it does inform, I think a lot about what, it, what I, what I'm like. And, and when you spend a lot of time with yourself, when you're comfortable with yourself alone, you know, that's where a lot of the great ideas come from and the brainstorming. And so, uh, I'm also able to be laser focused I've got no distractions, you know, so those things are, are important. And again, it, it comes at the expense of being, you know, I'm, I'm not as social as other people. And, and for me, it, it's become a, a positive because it gives me that, you know, that focus and the, the drive. And a lot of people like they panic when they're by themselves. Like I, I'm most comfortable at home with my wife and my dogs and I, I, I could go, months without seeing anybody else and be absolutely fine. So I know that's very different than a lot of other people. <laughs> we're, we're very similar, actually. So how do you make sure you fit this in? You know, like you've got the business, you've got the dogs, you've got the social media empire, you've got the wife. How do you make sure that you, you know, you have time for yourself, that you're, you know, have a great relationship, that you do like whatever you need to in your daily, you know, how do you build your, your daily, your daily schedule to make sure that you fit everything in, but still have the time for your wife, still have the time for your development and things like that? Well, my, for most of our time together, we, we've been together for 15 years. We met in college. The moment, the moment we left college, she moved with me to Milwaukee, where I was born and raised, and we, you know, have been together since. Uh, you know, she, she's been involved in some way with my business. So we see, like, we both work from home. My wife is a writer, but she helps a lot with, with, with my business, and it's really our business. You know, my, my business is hers. You know, it, it's for, for the family, and she's been a big part of that. So we see each other a lot. If anything, we've got to find time for her to have her time uh, so that she doesn't go crazy just being around me all the time. So, uh, and, and, you know, also the dogs are hugely advantageous on social media. Anytime I throw the dogs in a photo, it gets a way better response. So, uh, but yeah, we, we like to, we love our nightly family time. Like one thing we try to do is after, you know, 8 PM, we shut things down and watch TV and hang out together and, you know, snuggle with the, with the boxers. And, uh, so we kind of have that packaged in. So we can have some sort of disconnect from work, even though because when you work from home, 
you know, you, you can, you, it's a completely customizable schedule. So if anything, you know, I, I can work on weekends if I want and it starts, everything starts bleeding into like all these days bleed into one long day unless you really uh, start structuring things appropriately. And especially during the winter, man, like we, we, unless we get groceries or go out to eat, like we won't even leave the house. So we've got to be uh, cognizant of finding ways to get out of the house, out of the work environment, and then, you know, shutting things down in a way where it's not just all work. But again, that's part of why, what, why it's important to do what you love if you can, or at least something that you're, you know, you're passionate about because it's all work, right? It's all going to be hard. It's going to be less shitty if you at least enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, that's what I say to people is fitness doesn't need to be a three hour thing. You can go, you know, do something in the morning and then still have time for the kids for, you know, going out and doing stuff. You know, you don't need to be working out every single day. You just need to build it into your schedule and, you know, fit it in. And I think this is why people like your stuff so much. It's, you know, it's short, it's sharp, it's impactful. You know, like I do an hour of jiu-jitsu three times a week. And I mean, I've just started doing gym sessions as well. And that's probably far more than I need to be doing. But just an hour in jiu-jitsu taught me how much flapping around three hours in the gym lifting weights actually is. You know, you're not pushing yourself nearly as much as they think they are, these guys who spend five hours in the gym. It's... It's a mindset I think we need to come away with, you know, to avoid the the mirror muscles only, to avoid only training the body because we walk enough, you know. We don't need to do legs because we do a lot of walking. I hate these kind of myths that just won't die. Um, so wh- I know we've been talking for over an hour, so I've just noticed that I've got so many more questions, but what do you want everyone listening to this interview to take from it? What would you like the go-home message to be? You know, number one, when you are evaluating anything related to your fitness or an exercise or workout program, the first question you must ask, is it sustainable? Because if it's not sustainable, it's questionable, right? If you know that you can't work out for 90 minutes a day, six days a week for the rest of your life, why would you start it, start doing that in January? You're you're not, I mean, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. So if you want to set yourself up for success, you know, find the minimum effective dose you know you can sustain with. If it's 10 minutes, if it's 15 minutes, start there and then sustain it. Prove to yourself it becomes part of your life. You can always add time, but it's very hard to take away time. You know, uh, it's, it's just one of those things. Like, you can always, um, it's the exact opposite of pricing. Like, you could always uh, lower your price, right? I mean, no one's ever going to say anything bad about that. But it's very difficult to raise your price. Once people are used to doing like an hour workout a day, they, they can't possibly get the same benefits in 10 minutes in their mind. When we know the research shows that the most important thing, if you want to change your body at a cellular level, it's intensity. I mean, there was a study done where they took a 10-minute circuit. And one group did that circuit one time for a 10-minute workout. The other group did that workout three times for a 30-minute workout, but it was the same 10-exercise circuit. Obviously, the 30-minute group, they trained three times as long. They burned more more overall calories. But the post-workout metabolic impact was identical between both sessions, 10 versus 30 minutes, identical post-workout metabolic impact. So right there, I mean, we just, we know this. Intensity is the most important thing. If the the dose is intense enough, but not too intense, within 30 to 45 minutes, in most cases, you can get everything you want out of a fitness program and provide just enough stress, but not too much stress, so that it becomes something that is difficult to recover from, right? We want to stimulate, not annihilate. So uh, fitness becomes actually, it's way more, accessible than people think because it does, it does not require two hour plus marathon sessions. We know the research shows that anything past 45 minutes, not including maybe a warm up and cool down, but anything of like intensive training going beyond 45 minutes at most an hour it is counterproductive, not only diminishing returns, but it's going to make it more difficult for you to recover and get ready for the next session. So you're optimized for most people are going to be optimized with, you know, at least three, you know, two to three 
30 to 45 minute workouts or less a week. It, it, that, again, that, that is like the sustainable sweet spot that anybody can continue to follow for the rest of their life. You might move to doing four or five workouts. You might bump that up to 60 minutes, whatever. But like at the same time, why, why would you want to? If you can get the results in 30 minute workouts and then just refine your your program by, you know, using more advanced movements or mixing things up when you need to. That that is a sustainable way to approach it. If you're never gonna if you don't want to be a marathon runner, don't try to do a marathon to lose weight. It's a terrible idea. Terrible idea. If you love running and you want to do a marathon, great. But if you're if you're like, oh I I'm gonna sign up for a marathon, you know, it's so it's gonna give me a reason to get in shape and lose weight. It's like well, unless you plan on doing an endless number of marathons, it's a terrible approach because you'll never – you can't do that amount of training for the rest of your life unless you're a marathoner. So, uh, again, it's, it's going, going after that whole, that whole theme, man. It's like if it's not sustainable, it's questionable. And that, that applies to diet, to exercise, to everything that we're pursuing. You know, and you can't be consistent with something if it's not sustainable. Yeah, that's the thing is, why are they going to do it in January compared to December? Why wait till Monday when you can start on a Thursday? I, I, you know, it's, it's this BS that we tell ourselves. So if I was to ask you, like, this is the second last question. If I was to ask you for an unusual fact about yourself, you know, I noticed that you have acres and acres of comments from people on YouTube videos, etc., saying how much you've helped them, how awesome they think you are and that, but... What's an unusual fact about yourself that very few people would know? Oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much an open book. I mean, for the most part. I mean, actually, I think one thing people think, well, they think I work out all the time. Like, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that you can actually film a video and then save it and post it later. You know, like, they think that, I, that I'm literally working out all day. They'll say, oh, I wish I could be like you and work out all day. It's like no, I, I, at most it would I would train for about an hour, and uh, beyond the, the dog walking and the mobility work that gets peppered in here and there, I spend the rest of the day just like everybody else, you know, uh, doing work and building my business and spending time with my family and my wife and my dogs, and so, and I also am I'm really a fat guy faking it as a fit guy, you know, like I, I could very easily go right back to the person I was before. I mean, that, that per, again, I'm the same person, but different in a lot of ways. And, it, it, and, and, and I'm different through my experience in fitness. So uh, I exercise so that when I lay down on the couch and, and binge watch Netflix, I'm not too guilty about it, you know, or that I can have my, you know, my burgers and fries on Fridays for my fuck it meal. So I'm a lot more like, the average person, as strange as I, I probably am and as eccentric as some of the things that I've shared over the course of this podcast, you know, uh, there's a common humanity in all of us that, you know, we'd all like to be lazier. We all enjoy being lazy and being gluttonous and, you know, uh, all that stuff. And just like you, I'm, I'm fighting those urges every single day. And uh, I just so happen to have a little more accountability built in than the average person because, you know, uh, I can't get too fat. Otherwise, people won't, won't look at the stuff that I'm sharing. So uh, that's probably one fun fact. I love 90s r and I, lo I love TV and movies. Like, uh, just, I mean, I try to watch – we try to watch something every night if possible. So, uh, yeah, man, I'm probably a lot lazier than people think. I, I just – I, I got to keep myself motivated and, and keep pushing myself to not let my inner laziness uh, spill out. So you've got your website and you know your podcast. There's literally so much value in gold there. How can people listening, you know, find out more about you and keep in touch? Because I've barely scratched the surface of the kind of stuff I want to find out. I mean, I'm I'm so intrigued in how you build your business, your creativity, how, how you're so good in the camera and stuff like that. So I definitely want to have you on again, but. For those people who are really interested in finding out more about you, how can they keep in touch, see your projects, you know, subscribe to your site, follow you on social media, that sort of thing? 
Well, you can follow me everywhere on social media at DJ Gador, B J G A D O U R. My website is thedailybj.com. No, it is not blowjobs. <laughs> I know that was everybody's thinking here, and obviously we're having fun. You know, by the way, like BJ is a nickname. Uh, my father's name is Brahim, which is Abraham in Arabic, and uh, J is for Junior. So I, I'm 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 the second. So it's Brahim Junior. But obviously, no one knows how to say that, and it's kind of a weird sounding name. And uh, there's uh, parts of America that are not very receptive to a name like that. So I, I've always gone under BJ. And uh, though the nickname I got, I got the nickname in third grade without ever knowing the implications of what it would be like in high school and then growing up uh, and having a career with the name BJ. But uh, I, I, you know, the dailybj.com is a way that has, I have fun with it. I know you're thinking about it. Um, it's actually not blow job, but even if it was, you're going to get the best workouts possible that you can do at home. It's, it's, it's also nine. This is a funny side note too. It's, it's nine sixty nine per month. So I, I tried to put as much sexual innuendo into it as possible. Uh, the slogan for the site is being fit is hard. Suck it up. Instead of nine ninety nine, I made it nine sixty nine. So it had the sexual innuendo, but I get $30, 30 cents less on every sale per month. Just for the joke. So I mean, that's why I love you because I think it's, you know, when I seen that, I thought, oh, just another fitness guy. But it was the swearing, it was the fuck it meals, it was the, you know, you go to get like burger and chips as your cheap meals. That you've got the the sex jokes and, you know, you take the mick out um, people who've been cheeky and comments and stuff like that. You know, you're actually just a normal guy. And you're helping so many people. You should be like really proud of the work you're doing. It's just amazing to see how much you developed, and there's a lot of love out there for you. Um, is there anything that we should be looking out for? Any projects? Any products coming out? Well, one thing I'll add to that too, like it's amazing all the shit that we got growing up become huge assets to you down the road if if you let them. Right? I mean, like being made fun of, like people would literally call me blowjob. I mean, high school was basically me being called blowjob, you know, nonstop, you know, uh, people making jokes. And as humiliated as I was at the time, now it's become my brand. Like, it's, it's almost like Eminem and 8 Mile. It's like, what else are you going to say about me at this point? You know, I, I put it out there. I have fun with it. I, I own it. And uh, the, it's it, all the stuff that has humbled us along the way become huge assets down the road if you let them. So all the failures we have become amazing teaching tools. Like before I took the men's health job, I came off the biggest failure of my life. I had had an online, I created the first online streaming fitness company called StreamFit in 2011. Nobody else was on market with a streaming fitness program at the time. It was almost, in reality, I may have came in too early with it because people were still consuming DVDs too much and I didn't have as big of a following at the time, so it was harder for me to get as many people over to it. I didn't raise enough money. Uh, I I, I was hoping to do it with less money than I I raised, and I ended up needing more money in the process. But I I had, in the process of that four-year business, even though we had some – it was a six-figure business. We had some success, but ultimately I couldn't scale it, and I, I wanted to sell it to a big publishing company, and I failed to do so. But in that four-year failure, I acquired hundreds upon hundreds of hours of on-camera work. Like you asked, like, how do you become, you know, I was terrible on camera. Like I was looking the other day at an interview I did in a local Milwaukee TV station. Uh, it was called The Morning Blend in Milwaukee. And my first time on TV and I was so bad. You know, I said absolutely like 38 times. Like it was like my crutch when I didn't know what to say. I would say absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I was so low energy and I didn't look at the camera and I was mumbling. And so again, like that failure for me of not being able to, of having to go to, you know, investors, it's one thing to lose your own time and, and, and money. And, and we burned through all our savings to keep that business afloat. I, I was unsalaried most of the time I, I was working that company. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to lose your time and money to go to people you respect uh, that have backed you from just a concept and not be able to give them a return was devastating. Like I, I went through a very serious depression, uh, for a period of time. And, uh, but with that came 
this men's health opportunity, which required someone who could do on-camera uh, work, who was comfortable doing media, who had a lot of experience working with people in fitness, knew how to write, all this stuff, like all the shit you go through, being made fun of. And uh, you, I acquired, uh, like Liam Neeson, a certain set of skills that was perfect for that opportunity that was waiting for me that I had no idea would be coming. So, you know, that, that, that is something that I, I, I try to I share because we all go through these times in our life where, you know, things never work out the way they, they you want them to in a lot of ways. And uh, like we talked about comparing yourself to others, comparing yourself to who you wanted to be. Like I, I used to joke, not joke, I was serious. It's, it's a joke now. I would tell people that I'm going to retire by the time I'm 35. And I'm 35 and I'm like just getting started. Like I was that naive that I thought I'd be so rich by the time I was 35 that I could stop working if I wanted to. And now I'm literally, I, I, I left Men's Health in June and I'm, I'm com completely starting over again. So uh, I'm humbled by that, like that I actually said to someone out loud, I'm going to retire by the time I'm 35. And so, you know, if, if I wanted to beat myself up about the fact that I, I didn't hit that goal, <laughs> I could. At the same time, like I've been blessed in a lot of ways to only get opportunities that I was ready for. You know, I, I think the biggest gift someone can get uh, is to only get opportunities that they're ready for. Because if you get an opportunity that you're not ready for, there definitely won't be other ones. <laughs> OK. And uh, so I mean, that was a long way of saying, like, embrace who you are, you know, uh, the, who knows what current failures or struggles you're going with right now that are going to set the stage for that next big opportunity. If, if you just keeping your eyes open for it, and you lie yourself to, I mean, if you pour yourself into your work and what you enjoy doing, you know, you may not have, uh, may not be the most wealthy or well-known person in the world, but I guarantee you, if you pour yourself into what you take, you take pride into what you do, there, there will be so much available to you because the, the, the fact remains, like, if you just keep showing up, if you keep showing up, you will be the last person left in the room at some point. I promise you that. It's happened to me time and time again. The stubborn person that just keeps showing up after every time that they, they could have just quit or gone in a different direction, you know, uh, and... and being able to ha handle all those obstacles and those disturbances that make people kind of question who they are and then jump ship and go on to the next thing, like the stubborn refusal to keep going, to fail forward, uh, you will be the only person left in the room. The opportunities will be there. It might take 17 years, right? I was just joking about the 17-year you know, thing to get on the cover of Men's Health. I set that goal 17 years ago, and you know, uh, there, there are all these goals I think about that I wanted to achieve. Like we're hoping to get to California. I always, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, brutal winters. And then I went to school in Massachusetts and now we live in Pennsylvania because that's where men's health is located. And, uh, finally I'm at the point where we're going to be moving to California, hopefully in June of next year. So I can, you know, this is my, this is going to be like my last winter. And I'm so excited. I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully nothing bad happens. I really want to get to California because I, I just want to be somewhere warm and really enjoy our life and be more active and everything else. But I think about that being a big goal for me. And I think about how one of the big things I have something at the website we call, you know, or I share like hashtag steak Sundays. One of the biggest goals for me was just to get to the point through fitness where I could afford to have a really good piece of steak each week. It's these simple things like about quality of life that, have meant the most to me and any time in my life that I've let something like money become the, the most important factor or something that isn't true to, to really inspiring and impacting other people and creating, you know, like the ultimate lifestyle for my family. Like I can, if I want, I can go right now and my wife and I can watch, you know, some TV in bed and, on an afternoon if we want to, you know, and just to have that flexibility to me is more important than any sort of money I could ever get. Hmm. So, uh, you know, really, really being comfortable with yourself, knowing who you are, keep showing up. Amazing things can happen to you in this world. And uh, and we live in such an amazing time, man, where, you know, we can all connect. 
and, and you can share your vision, your voice with as many people as possible, as many people really a, as you're willing to reach, like, cause it, it's hard, right? I mean, to get people to listen to you and, and take you seriously. And, but you know, it, when, when you're true to what you're doing and you, you love it and, and you stick with it, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I've talked about man in the mirror. I've talked about keep showing up, keep showing up is that, that, ha that has to do with consistency, but more so just like, it's just not being so flighty. You know, when you really want to do something, it's not an option, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not a choice. And uh, so that, to me, it's like if, I, if you don't keep showing up, you're not serious about whatever you're doing. And it's time to find something that, that gets you to keep showing up because no matter what it is, you'll have a lot more satisfaction with your life if, if it inspires you to keep showing up and keep pursuing it and keep becoming the best at it that you can be. Because that's what I say to people is, you know, there's no such thing as a bad thing. It's a learning experience or you succeed. You know, if you just keep going and going, you never know where it's going to lead you. You know, it's like your pain and misery now can be used later in life. And I think this is a, this is the thing is we dwell on the negative without looking at the positive and the opportunities from it and you know you're doing amazing work from it is there i mean have you got any products coming out lately well we've got uh at the time we're recording this like we're doing a big thing for the new year called the post-holiday shred which is like a 12-week program that uh you know nutrition and workouts that will really help kind of get people a good jump start for the new year but again like the dailybj.com is a lifestyle site so we give meal prep videos podcasts you know, you're getting monthly workouts. It, it's uh, the whole thing is not about a quick fix, but making it part of your life. And and me just sharing how I do that. Like it's me and my wife cooking in the, the kitchen, making fun of each other and getting sassy and, you know, sharing the meals I eat, the workouts I do. And but also having some fun along the way. And, you know, it's not so one dimensional that it's all fitness uh, in terms of like stuff that's in the mix. You know, uh, there are definitely some projects that I'm working on that I probably shouldn't talk about it until I know that they're actually going to happen because as you know, I'm sure like when you're, when you're an entrepreneur and you're doing your own thing, like you have a lot of ideas, very few of them actually come to fruition, especially when they depend on some other people, you know, you can't really determine what's happening there, but, uh, there, there are definitely some cool things I'm working on. The big thing though is, uh, you know, we're trying to get to California and, you know, if we want to start a family and set up the next phase of our life, we just want to find some roots um, cause, uh, temp Pennsylvania for us is just a temporary stay and looking forward to that warm weather. And, and I think that'll also hopefully inspire even more content out of me because, uh, I'll probably be in better shape too. Cause obviously when it's, when it's snowing outside, I don't, I don't have to be shirtless as much. So I don't have to be as in good of shape, but in California, like, you know, I've got to be, uh, I'll probably be in the best shape of my life. Hopefully. <laughs> I've got a heap of questions about how to raise healthy, strong, you know, fit young men, about how to be a good father and stuff like that. So, you know, that'll be the next, I'll have you back on for that. I, I mean, I really cannot thank you. And I've, I've barely touched the surface. And I, I feel like there's so much more we could go into just now. But I'm really appreciative of your time. I mean, that's an hour and a half now. And it feels like 10 minutes because it's such a joy to listen to you. I, I know this will have helped so many people, but I know that there's so much more we can cover. So I'd love to have you on again. Um, the floor is open to you. If there's anything that you'd like to mention, anything you don't think we've covered, you know, go ahead. Well, uh, before we, before anybody passes out from listening, I, I, I probably don't have anything else to say at this point. Just that I'm grateful, man. Thank you for having me on. You know, uh, I, I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me anytime wants to listen to anything I have to say. So I, I do appreciate that. I appreciate your support. And I encourage you to keep, you know, doing your thing and uh, keep this podcast going and keep sharing good stuff with good people. And, you know, I'm happy to come on anytime you need me. Thank you. I mean, that really means a lot for especially somebody that I look up to and admire for the just the quality of the stuff you're doing and like how many lives you're changing to think, you know, that you can even pay attention to something like my podcast, you know, it kind of blows me away. So I would, uh, it's been an absolute honor and, um, I'll be, I'll be in touch soon with the links, etc. but I cannot thank you enough. Um, you're a fantastic guy and uh, I wish you nothing but success for the future. 
Thank you very much to BJ there. That was some great advice and some concrete action steps that you can take no matter your starting point. I would just like to thank you as well, the listener. I hope you enjoy these podcasts and get something from them. If you've got five minutes spare, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. I thoroughly enjoy doing this and every review helps to keep the motivation, the desire and the passion going. It also helps me attract future guests. As always, thank you for taking the time to listen to the nextlevelguy.com podcasts. That's it for another week. Thanks for listening. Absorb it. Practice it. Use it. Until next time, keep trying to hit that next level in your life.